Welcome to the latest installment of the CSPS Virtual Cafe. I'm Taiki Sarantakis, the president of the Canada School of Public Service. And today we are talking about a very, very important issue, and that's cyberspace, and more specifically, cybersecurity. And like all of our virtual cafes, we try to make them not only educational, but also fun, because there's no, no law or rule that says that learning should be boring and in fact it's kind of the opposite the more fun you can make something the more uh, prone you are to learn and to retain so today we have two very special guests uh, to talk about cybersecurity, and they are two world-class experts the first is melissa hathaway and melissa is literally one of the top experts in cybersecurity in the world she has done bipartisan work in the white house working on cybersecurity for both the Bush and Obama administrations. She regularly speaks to elites all over the world, including Harvard University, and she's currently the president of Hathaway Global Strategies. Melissa, welcome. Thank you. Our, next, you. our next guest, uh, we're going to introduce him indirectly. So, Melissa, this is actually a little bit of education for you. Now, in the United States of America, the most famous bureaucrat in kind of non-COVID times is typically like a general or an ambassador to the United Nations or a long-standing head of the CIA. In Canada, the most famous bureaucrat is actually a gentleman named Dave Phillips. And he's a meteorologist in our environment department. And I've always found that very Canadian that our most famous bureaucrat is somebody that, that kind of tells us about the weather. I'm making a prediction today. I'm making a prediction that the person who succeeds Dave Phillips as the most famous bureaucrat in Canada will actually be the gentleman that uh, is going to be opposite of Melissa today. And his name is Scott Jones. Scott, tell us what you do. Well, uh, thanks. Uh, thanks for that, Taiki. I'm not sure I can live up to Dave's uh, reputation and, uh, early morning media briefings. Um, but I'm the head of the Canadian Centre for Cybersecurity that was created about two and a half years ago now to uh, to be the front door for cybersecurity incidents and operational and advice and guidance for the federal government uh, across the country. Terrific. So today, like I said, we're talking about cybersecurity. In the bookcase behind me, I pulled out some books that are starting to pile up on my reading list. So I've got The, the Hacker and the State, and I've got The Perfect Weapon. And I've got, here's a scary title by a very brilliant man. Click here to kill everybody. The Virtual Weapon. So, Melissa, what's going on? Wow. It's funny. I know Lucas, David, and all of those authors are all colleagues of mine. Um, well, I think, you know, it's really important to put it in context. Over the last 30 years, we have connected um, our critical infrastructures, uh, corporate networks and everything to the internet and um, to uh, work toward a, a digital um, transformation. And it currently represents about 15% of the global economy, our digital economy. And in 2020, we saw a rapid acceleration um, of this digital transformation um, at, because 85% of our companies had to prioritize becoming more digital. And we had 300% increase in remote work because we had the, the shutdown. And we saw the turning to artificial intelligence and other things to increase customer interactions. And so we became even more dependent on, on the internet um, and we see these as key initiatives for our countries as the digital economy of, of accelerating that digital transformation. And I know that in Canada, you're investing $180 billion for the transformation of your core infrastructures. And here in the United States, we're, we're making similar investments for healthcare and other things. Our countries are connecting a minimum of 127 new devices every second to accelerate the contact less society because we're going to need to embrace technology even further as we go forward um, and um, post COVID era. But the challenge with that is, is that many of these devices over the last 30 years were fielded 
um, with core vulnerabilities with the principle of field it fast and fix it later. And I'm kind of famous for the coining the term of, you know, patch Tuesday leads to vulnerable Wednesday. And, um, and you know, last year alone, there were 1,100 vulnerabilities patched by Microsoft, 1,600 by Oracle. And it's just a volume of, of vulnerability that's in the core of our everyday society that we just can't sustain. So in 2020, we had a 715% increase in ransom attacks, mostly going against our healthcare and the medical industry. We had an increase of 150% of distributed denial of service attacks, which knocks you offline when you need to be online. We saw a 600% increase in um, the internet of things attacks because those vulnerable devices that we're fielding every second um, are being exploited and hijacked to steal your personal information, to steal your intellectual property, to hijack your bank, et cetera. So the destructive and disruptive activities are increasing at a, at a pace that is unsustainable for our governments and for our corporations. And I, I worry about the intellectual property theft, the compromising of our medical research, the conducting of influence campaigns to undermine our de democratic processes, the disrupting of our critical infrastructures and our core businesses, and then just the overall hacking of our international financial institutions and the like. The, the 2020 accelerated many of these things because we embrace that digital transformation and our governments continue to embrace that digital economy. It's really essential now that we co-invest in the resilience and that we try to draw down or buy down the risk that we've inherited and embraced over the last 30 years. And, and I'm you know, working with Scott and people all around the world of trying to raise that awareness within our governments and within our corporate environments of what is going to be necessary in order to ensure resilience and, and an ability to harvest the opportunity of the digital economy as we go forward. Thanks, Melissa. So Scott, Melissa raised a lot of the issues that we're gonna kind of go through a little more systematically as we go forward. One of the, the big things that I think people kind of intuitively get is that our economy is migrating online and we've seen kind of COVID accelerate that. And I think uh, Melissa said that about 15% of the global economy is online right now. It doesn't take a genius to see where that trajectory is going. It's probably not going to go down. It's probably going to keep going up. As our world and our economy starts to go online, are we ready, Scott? Well, you know, I think, I think we have to take a step back and look at this because, well, you might not be going online when you're doing a purchasing, say you're going to, that company is online. Its logistics supply chain is online. It requires all these online um, systems to be there. It is probably in a building that has the building systems that are online. And so that's what's accelerating now. The internet, we don't see. Um, so sometimes you see the internet of things, but we all think of that as things like smart speakers, smart light bulbs, the things we know about. But I'm talking about the things that control our buildings. I'm sitting in our very empty um, headquarters building right now, but every light here is controlled centrally and can be controlled. The heating system can be controlled remotely by the building managers. These are things that we don't see. And then there's the logistics chain. So when we looked at the National Cyber Threat Assessment, one of the things we wanted to talk about is, yes, there's all of these things we interact with on a daily basis, but most of our life is dependent on things we don't even know is connected to the internet. And that's the, that's the huge challenge for governments right now is, how do we start thinking about this? And I haven't even touched on the data it's generated. The, yeah. generated, the data it generates about us, what we do as individuals. Um, a lot has been made out of some of the privacy changes that have been made by these big internet companies where they're no longer searching through our emails to generate ads. It's because they don't have to. They have all the data they need to build the profiles of us. Um, they don't need to see us as individuals anymore because they've got us pegged. Um, and so we've got all of these challenges on the internet. So yeah, absolutely. There is a huge pressure that we're going to face um, as a nation. Are we ready? No, we're not. Yeah. Um, are we trying to be ready? Absolutely. Are there things that are getting better? Yes, organizations are understanding their systemic risk more. Um, boards of directors are talking about this. Cybersecurity requires investment, and it means when you're going to purchase, we need to start thinking about security differently. We cannot be lowest cost compliant for procurement, for example. We can't incentivize a, a CEO to cut spending on security um, for a product that is so integral to the management of our network in infrastructure. And you know, I know we'll probably touch on some of the recent 
large scale supply chain activities. Um, so these are things we've got to talk about incentives. We've got to talk about what is in industry and how do we start to change what is, you know, arguably the market failing uh, to address security as a real as a real risk. Yeah, and Scott brings up some really good points uh, that that people really need to internalize as public servants because sometimes you hear the word cyber and cybersecurity and you kind of go, well, that's not for me. That's kind of wires and physical things and you know if something happens my bank will reimburse me so i'm kind of good but cybersecurity isn't that you know it was that kind of maybe 15 years ago what it is now is exactly what scott is talking about which is it's almost everything it's the water that you drink it's the traffic lights that are telling you stop and go it is, in some cases, you know, your front door locking and unlocking. Uh, it is a speaker listening to you and then taking a cue from that. And it, there's vulnerabilities kind of everywhere. And as Melissa said, the vulnerabilities are increasing daily because the number of things that are going online is just exponential. Like we used to just a couple of years ago, we started hearing the phrase, the internet of things. And it was like, you know, by the year 2030, a million devices will be hooked up to the internet. My God, by the year 2030, I will have a million devices hooked up to the internet, just alone. Like everything is connected and not just everything is connected. That's only step one. Step two is when everything starts talking when your car starts talking to your garage door opener, to your furnace, to your lights. This is important for every, every policy analyst uh, in the government of Canada. Now let's kind of go back a little bit. The first time a lot of us started hearing this in like a real way was as a result of like a bad movie. Like a few years ago, something, there was a movie made by you know, Seth Gogan, Rogan, something like that. And then somebody got really, really mad at Sony. Uh, Scott, Melissa, who wants to kind of walk us through what happened, what, you know, some people call it an attack, some people call it mischief, some people call it espionage, some people call it an invasion of sovereignty. First kind of what happened, and then we'll talk about kind of what it was. Uh, so, um, the, this really bad movie that was produced by Sony Pictures, uh, which is a subsidiary of Sony Corp in the United States. So, so we have a Japan headquartered company with a, an American subsidiary, which I think is important. Um, the subsidiary in the United States was publishing this, uh, I think it's called The Interview, but a very bad movie and it was making fun of the, the North Korean government and, and North Korea broadly. And uh, North Korea took offense at this and, uh, and uh, demanded that uh, Sony Pictures not release the film. Um, and uh, so that let's say that that's the opening scene. Um, uh, Sony Pictures refused to uh, ask for or to obey or, or to meet the request of the North Korean government. And the North Korean government um, uh, and or its proxy penetrated uh, Sony Pictures, who had a very weak cybersecurity posture, um, uh, infiltrated their corporate networks, was able to expose corporate email, um, and tried to uh, really derail the launch of the uh, of the movie from going into the corporate networks. And concurrently, they made a, a general threat to the citizens if they went to the theaters. Um, to go watch the movie. So that let, let's say that's the that's the scene two or the kind of the cul the culmination. So it became into a really kind of a policy conundrum. President Obama at the time called it an act of vandalism first, and so that was an initial reaction. Bad corporate security, shame on you, Sony. Um, and uh, and so you know so you really needed to invest in that, and it's really uh, this is not a um, 
this is not a national security issue per se, because this is a movie and you're not a critical infrastructure. But when there was a, a key threat to the citizens, the government had to really step in and think through that maybe this is not an act of vandalism, that this is something that really requires some policy decision-making process. But the government was really not prepared for something like this. We're prepared for espionage, we're prepared for more destructive activities, but, but not something along these lines. What's interesting is that the parent company, Sony in Japan, said, we don't have anything to do with this. This is you know, Sony Pictures' responsibility. So the, the, the cross geography or the, the different jurisdictions of the corporations um, was also interesting to watch from a corporate perspective and corporate risk management. Um, they didn't see it as a real issue from that perspective. So uh, and that so, so that kind of is like the opening A, B, and C scenes, or one, two, three, and um, I, I don't think it really um, resolved very well. Uh, Sony Pictures they said they increased their cybersecurity. At the end of the day, they hired a new CISO. I would argue that they still don't really invest in the security of their corporate networks, um, and 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 so and the risk was not too great as far as harm um, from a consequence of lawsuits and other things. It was really embarrassment. So Scott, you have this company in uh, country A, and this company is attacked by either country B or the proxies of country B. If, if that country had sent in kind of stormtroopers, we would all get it. We would go, oh my God, we're under attack. Is this the responsibility of government? You work in government like I do. Is this something, is the government supposed to respond when somebody kind of attacks your company? So, so that's the, that actually is the key question here um, because I think you know a lot of us will argue, yes, is it reasonable to expect a company to be able to defend against a nation state that has decided to use national power? against them. We to your point, we wouldn't we wouldn't allow a covert action team to operate on our territory. Why is that okay in the digital space? On the other hand, um, we would also expect that company to have had better physical security, to have thought these things through and to have implemented uh, uh, some some security measures. So you know if you leave your front door open, uh, is it breaking and entering or not? Um, is a, is another part of the question. So this was this is a really complex issue. Uh, the issue for us is when you look at it, what it turned into is it actually set a pattern for the next generation of cybercrime as well. Hack, steal, blackmail. Mm -hmm. um, because ransomware, we've gotten better at. Um, companies have gotten better at preparing for that. This, this was a great pattern for steal the information, leak a little bit that's really embarrassing, especially anything entertainment related gets on TMZ and a few other things. Um, but then you blackmail them to try to try to get them to pay. So the blackmail in this case was don't don't put this movie out that was embarrassing. Um, but in the cybercrime case, it's pay us or we're going to let this go, and we're going to we're going to break your trust with your customers. We're going to break your trust with your with the people who've entrusted you with that data. So um, so there's a lot of there's a lot of pieces here. The fact that it's a nation state or a proxy is one of the actually hardest problems uh, because it's hard to distinguish. Um, you don't usually come out and put, you know, put your country's flag on. And frankly, you can fake that. And so that is the whole issue around attribution that we face. Um, and that's, that's another key issue for people to keep thinking about as they kind of manage programs or develop policies or react to events that what is happening in the cyber world has analogies in kind of the analog world. There's theft there's violence, there's attacks, there's good things, there's bad things, but do those rules kind of transfer one-to-one? -one? Like, is it assault when you click, I don't like? Uh, is it theft? Is it vandalism? Is it mischief? What is it? Because one of the things we know with the cyber is that it makes it easier to engage in these activities. The scale, the cost, the transaction costs are pretty low relative to kind of if you're doing, you know, creating uh, stormtroopers to kind of fly across the ocean and parachute uh, and penetrate kind of NORAD and NATO and that, it, you know, relatively speaking, a couple of clicks is pretty cheap. Now, Scott mentioned ransomware. We're going to get to ransomware 
in a few minutes because that's another big issue that's percolating in this world. Before we do, I want to move to what a lot of people, at least in the popular world, view as the the kind of the next one after Sony. And I always tr have trouble pronouncing this word, Stuxnet. So Melissa talked to us about uh, Sony. Scott, do you want to talk to us about what Stuxnet is? There's still a little bit of mystery around it. Uh, and maybe it's easier for you as a Canadian than somebody who's worked in the White House to talk about what Stuxnet is. Sure. Um, there's, some, there's some pretty public reporting and speculation on this, so uh, that's what I'll be mostly going off of. But So Stuxnet was a... Um, was a piece of um, software that was used to essentially go in, infiltrate Iranian centrifuges, and cause them to have a physical real-world effect, which was overspinning, meaning they spun so fast they, they spun themselves apart, essentially. Um, and so it was a way of achieving a national outcome um, in terms but using cyber means to do it rather than sending in bombers or missiles or other or other types of things. And it was, uh, it was to set back the uh, uranium enrichment uh, was the goal of this program. And so uh, what it was, was a piece of software that was very good at propagating. It was targeted for the, what are called programmable logic controllers, but the things that make the control how fast these, these centrifuges spin. Um, and it was said, go in, in this case, go and disable it. Um, what people talk about though, is that once you release something like this, other people can see it. They see how it works, they can take it, and then they, they can reuse it. And so that's what a lot of the debate has been, not the outcome of the initial. It's how do you, how do these tools get repurposed? Because once you release a cyber tool, um, others see it. Others see the vulnerability that was exploited. Others see the potential. And also, every time you move the line, and I would argue others are moving the line a lot more than, than our allies are. Um, once you move the line, the line has set. Um, is it an act of war or not? And so that's what, that's what a lot of the discussion is now. Um, I'm not going to weigh in on, I'm not an act of war expert on things. I'm a cybersecurity expert here. Um, but at the end of the day, to achieve that outcome, the, the kinetic options would have been the only thing prior to cyber. So those are some of the things that have to be discussed. But that's what, that's what Stuxnet really was. It was propagating. It would move itself around. Um, it was very targeted. It was written specifically for this, but it could be repurposed. So that's kind of the grosso modo summary of of it from my so, yeah, so in Sony, Melissa, just before, I'm going to turn to you in a sec, but in Sony, just for our viewers to get it, in Sony, a digital attack resulted in kind of digital coming back. So it was like files, you got files, whether it was like, you know, who's Brad Pitt, who does he like, who does he not like, what is the movie? In Stuxnet, a digital attack resulted in the physical world changing, where I think Scott said like a, a turbine or a fusion or something spun faster than it would have or spun slower, whatever the case was, something kinetic happened uh, as a result of that attack. Melissa. I think that uh, the, um, the Stuxnet was really the first um, reported case of a, an attack, a widely reported case of an attack on a critical infrastructure, Iran's nuclear program. And it, and it, and it affected one fifth of their nuclear centrifuges. So it disrupted, let's say, you know, 20% of their nuclear program and their ability to create nuclear weapons. So that, that was a strategic outcome that was desired by it. What was interesting about it, um, and maybe post it happening, is, is it was widely studied then by all of the security companies. So Symantec and McAfee and Kaspersky, um, and then the engineering um, uh, research institutions like CERN, all published papers on what had happened and how did it happen. So it was first, it was you know a blanket vulnerability in Microsoft that was exploited so that you could understand what was happening around the world. And then second, it was targeting Siemens software um, which was targeted at the for the engineering parts of the centrifuge and and the like. So they all published here. This is how this happened, and this is basically how you could do it again. 
And and then there we see the sons and daughters of Suxnet. It, you know, there is called uh, you know Shamoon and all of the different white, but there's like eleven different versions of Stuxnet that are now being used against critical infrastructures um, around the world because um, the security community widely evaluated it, published it, made it. You know, a bit, it's on Wikipedia, it's on WikiLeaks, it's on you know everywhere that um, and any of those research papers. So then it made it widely available to anybody, not just, a, you know, not just a nation state's military or intelligence service. Yeah, that's a huge point for people to remember. The tools of war, generally speaking, since uh, kind of civilization began, generally have been reserved for high level organizations like states and empires and, and things like that. The tools of war now, in theory, and not just in theory, but in practice, can be available to a really smart 12 year old in your neighbor's basement. Uh, and it, you know, it doesn't have to be a really rich 12 year old, it just has to be a really smart 12 year old. The next one, a couple of things happened uh, recently. There was an election, there was an insurrection, but something else happened that probably we'd be spending a lot of time talking about if there wasn't a insurrection, attack, whatever you want to, however you want to characterize it. We, I don't, I'm not sure if we have a name for it yet. Most people are calling it solar winds. Mm -hmm. Melissa, what is solar winds and why should we care? So I've, I've done a lot of analysis on this and um, solar winds, um, it's what I look at, it's called solar winds because solar winds is a company that provides, um, has the largest market share in network management and monitoring. So companies and governments all around the world are using this software product to monitor their networks for security, optimize their networks for efficiency and, and the like. And, and again, SolarWinds is the best product, best in class. It's uh, you know the upper right quadrant of uh, Magic Quadrant for Gartner. And um, it's really the only product in its class for doing both the management and the monitoring. So uh, they were very public about their customer space. Um, they serve the Fortune 500. They serve many parts of the US government and other governments around the world. All of those um, entities were all published on their website up until about December 15th. So um, I look at this as a comprehensive um, ICT supply chain attack. So it's you're going after um, a company that has a large market share um, that can get you into a lot of other targets, so nested target. And what happened was is that uh, uh, SolarWinds through a series of um, decisions for um, optimizing costs and uh, not paying enough attention to security uh, had its engineering was being developed over in Belarus, um, Czech Republic and Poland. Um, and uh, and it didn't have very good security processes for its technology. It became a high value target. So wait a sec, Melissa. You you just a moment ago you said this was best in class, Gartner top quadrant. Now you're saying it didn't have very good security. What? There's a disconnect there. Yeah, yeah. That's because um, it's a product that was uh, looking at for network management and monitoring, and it wasn't actually protecting itself from making sure that its product couldn't be manipulated or its product wasn't vulnerable and the like. So it was good for what you know it was selling. This is the typical thing that we're seeing across the whole ICT industry. Field it fast, fix it later, or field it fast or whatever, and we're gonna optimize our costs by outsourcing it to the engineers in Eastern Europe or in the former Soviet Union. And we're not going to invest in the security of our own company because that's affecting my bottom line. And you see this across the board. The entire ICT industry, I would argue, is negligent in this in this manner. Um, and so, um, so they became a high value target. And it's reported by the security firms and the United States government that this was at least initially the company SolarWinds was targeted by the Russian government and specifically two of their intelligence services, the SVR and the FSB. And, um, and so uh, I believe that they, they, the government Russians, did a very good reconnaissance of SolarWinds and they initially implanted a um, software malware on SolarWinds network to observe their development process, how they develop code, 
and um, and then they were able to understand those processes well enough that they were able to implant code to enable backdoors into the um, into their program. So now the Russians can actually update the code, and SolarWinds has no idea what that is. And that happened as early as um, as uh, September of 2019. So they had already, Russia had already chosen this company long before that, because you're now doing your reconnaissance. They get into the company in September 2019. They start modifying the code um, undetected by solar winds. And then they um, embedded uh, malicious software, at least two versions of malicious software within the software updates. So if I'm now me and I'm connected to solar winds, I'm now going to get a software update but I'm going to get a software update with also malicious software that I'm, is going to evade any detection mechanism because it's been signed and it's you know legitimate in my network, and is now going to enable um, an outlet or a backdoor by which the Russians can get into now whatever that nested target, whoever the next company or um, government is, and that all happened between October 2019 all the way through June 2020. Uh, and um, and there's so there's multiple multiple aspects of the of the malware. The malware didn't really start. Um, so how was it discovered? That's the next important thing. Is uh, the company FireEye, which is known for cybersecurity, penetration testing, and forensic analysis for many of our governments and many of our companies. Um, had a, a phone call about um, uh, one of the employees' credentials. And so it tipped them to start looking for, that is really strange. We need to start looking at our, our credentialing mechanism, our active directory, the identity access management of our network. And they discovered that they had been breached and that they had lost intellectual property. All, at least 300 of their forensic tools were stolen, illegally copied. And then after about another week of forensic analysis, they determined that they had, um, because I think FireEye has very good security, they found that they were a victim of the solar winds breach and because they were running solar winds on their network. And, um, and so they are one of 18,000 companies that were affected that had the malware delivered to their network and many government institutions and, um, and so that's how we found out. And we didn't find out until December of 2020. So the Russians had about over a year of access into at least 18,000 targets, maybe longer than, maybe more than that, because there's more than 300,000 customers of solar winds. And uh, so I'll, I'll, I can stop, I can keep on going or I can stop there. We'll, we'll pause you there for a second. So Scott, the kind of the Canada US ratio is usually about 10 to 1. So we've heard a lot about solar winds in the United States, but it's not, as, as we understand it, uh, isolated to the United States. What's kind of the fallout in Canada of solar winds? Well, there's a, there's a, there's a few things, because that was a, it's an amazing summary of the, of the event. Um, the only thing I would actually add is uh, the kudos for FireEye for being proactive and disclosing and having the courage. They could have held back until it was a mandatory reporting period. Um, they, they, other than doing it a few weeks before Christmas um, and kind of wrecking the entire security community's uh, holiday season. Um, but they, they, let us, they let us get access and to, to deal with these things really quickly. Um, and Microsoft also did a substantial amount of contribution to this research as well. And the other security community has gone in, but you know, FireEye deserves a lot of credit for uh, the courage to come forward, not all companies do that. So, um, but if we if we go back and what's the impact on Canada? Uh, of course, Canadian Canadian uh, Canadian industry uh, runs this. Canadian government has some things. Uh, luckily, um, in many cases, they hadn't installed the vulnerable version, the version that had been uh, compromised through the supply chain attack. Um, you know, I kind of sarcastically said, "Thank God the government's patching is bad." Sometimes it actually paid off in this case. A lot of Canadian industry, I've talked to quite a few uh, Canadian CISOs who who've said the same thing. Um, but furthermore though, I think when you go back, it also goes to our investment in cybersecurity because there are ways that would have, even with this supply chain um, compromise and this software being compromised, if you'd run it in the way that security best practices has established, which is something like this, you do not leave connected to the internet. You zone it into a management network you couldn't have been compromised. 
even though you were running the, the vulnerable version. And so there are many ways this could have been stopped. Yes, SolarWinds um, had some things to do, but zoning this, running it properly, isolated. There were Canadian companies that had the vulnerable version, but they had isolated it. They had isolated their management network. Because the other thing is, this product was designed in a way where you had to disable parts of your antivirus and security protection just to make it work. And it had such pervasive access. You're essentially, it is the skeleton key to get into all of the things it manages. And so this is where we need to start looking at not just the supply chain, but also how are companies using this? There are ways to do it and they're well understood. It's well documented. I'm not talking about an air-gapped classified network um, with expensive multi-million dollar encryption devices. I'm talking about separating from the internet, disconnected so that they can't connect back in. Um, and that alone protected some agencies. So we did not see, there was reports of one compromise in media, uh, in Canadian companies. There was also a kill switch embedded in the software uh, that the researchers have found that was sent out to a number of victims. So it disabled the back door if the actor in question, and I won't say a country name here, um, given my role, if the actor in question wasn't interested. And so that was also something that was sent out as well. So there was a lot of things here. Um, I will say from my, from my background, this was a very well orchestrated intelligence operation. Um, it was well thought out. Uh, Melissa hit on all the reconnaissance pieces, so I don't, have, I don't have to sit on any of those. Um, but it's, it, it does go to the vulnerability of the industry in terms of we need to start thinking about systemic risk and how do these things compound. And our IT departments, what are they facing? Every IT department is about cutting costs. Mm -hmm getting down to the lowest cost possible, outsource this, get this into the hands of the cheapest thing possible because that's not my bottom line. Um, I was, uh, I was, uh, they're one of the things that somebody had, I, had said, and I wish I could attribute the quote because I feel bad I should, um, but they said, you either know you're a digital company or um, you're, going to go, you're, you're going to go out of business because you're gonna drive yourself that way. Um, and that goes for government as well. So that, that's kind of the, the, the overall summary. Canada didn't seem to be heavily targeted by the actor in this case. We were, we did have the software, we were vulnerable, we could have been. Um, it seems to, and we've got pretty good indications that um, there were no major compromises, mostly because, you know, we're probably not the, we probably weren't on the top of the target list this time. Yeah. So now again, I'm in, I'm kind of an ordinary citizen. Um, I'm kind of looking at this and throwing my hands up and I'm like, well, doesn't sound like there's a lot I can do. I mean, it sounds like, like, like Scott, I think I heard this first from you that the biggest security, um, weakness in every organization is that ultimately, you know, it's hooked up to a carbon based organism, i.e. a human being. But in this case, the way Melissa described it, kind of, it sounds like most people, not the, the solar winds, but most people outside of solar winds did the right thing. They were buying, you know, the top security system. They bought kind of best in class. They were there, they were that. And yet still there were vulnerabilities. So a little bit, I'm hearing a little bit different from you. Well, um, sorry, uh, I would, I would argue, I'd say, I'd say Melissa really hit the, hit it earlier and it's, it is a best-in-class product for what it does, right? But what the what everybody who bought it was looking for the best-in-class product for what it does. They weren't evaluating how it was built and how it was built to be secure. They were evaluating it for that for that function, and that's where that's where I would say the the carbon-based problem is that they were looking for the lowest cost. Um, right. They weren't valuing security. They weren't looking at it from a threat actor's perspective. What would it let somebody get access to if it was compromised? Because if they had, they would have deployed it differently. They would have invested in their IT security department to deploy it properly. Um, and they would have been looking and saying and demanding things like, okay, I want this product to go through some sort of vulnerability testing. Let's get together as industry who's going to use this and put it through proper testing. Um, now, there are some features in there that looks like the actor knew that this might happen. But, you know, there are things that we can do as an industry. Um, vote wallet and the power of procurement is pow super powerful. You need customers. Um, that's where I would say ultimately the failure was not emphasizing that part of this product. I agree so, with that. And I, yeah. and I think it's really important to 
when you look at the, the, the key financial institutions that were using it, the key government entities that were using it, there should have been a demand for a due diligence of the product um, based on their requirement for, you know, um, uh, mission assurance, if you will, right? You know, you can't afford for the banking institutions to have a vulnerability that could literally disrupt finance around the world. And uh, so, and, and I think that, when you look at the, they had their 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 password for downloading the software updates was SolarWinds one two three unencrypted. I mean, it was just like you 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 can't you can the gross negligence and I don't use that lightly. The gross negligence of SolarWinds um, on the 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 security of their own infrastructure. I, I don't think this is a they're not going to survive this event because uh, we're going to rip and replace it out of our infrastructure. So, and it represented this particular platform, Orion, which is their flagship platform, represented 45% of its revenue. Yeah. So you've both directly and indirectly touched on something that we don't think about a lot, which is kind of the supply chain of these things. And Scott kind of said, well, you know, the, the carbon-based organism made a mistake because it didn't go back and kind of check the supply chain across everything. Is that kind of realistic? Like, do I have to, before I buy my next iPhone or my next Android or, you know, my uh, IoT connected coffee cup and my IoT connected uh, bronze toothbrush, do I have to go back and, first of all, what is the supply chain? And second, do I have to go back and kind of do that myself? So Melissa, first, maybe what is the supply chain? For a typical, like we have chips, where right. are chips made? We have uh, fiber, where's fiber? Like this is, this is a lot of stuff that comes together to make something, you know, IOT or something digital. We have a, a global um, supply chain and whether the chip was designed in Seattle, it's usually produced over in China and, and you know, and when you put together your iPhone or my computer, it probably has 20 flags or more associated with it as far as the, where the keyboard is made, where the silicon is made, where the screen is made, et cetera. So when we, when we start to make decisions based on um, the flag of where the production is, I think that's unhelpful. Helpful. What we do need to start to think about is how do we bring all of these different piece parts together and architect for resilience, architect for safety, um, as especially as we're moving more to this automated and, and, um, and autonomous, we need to be thinking about safety first. We need to be thinking about resilience, um, security, privacy, and, you know, and, and those have to be key function features that we demand and likely will have to be demanded at a governmental level because the industry and its piece parts are not necessarily incentivized. But if I have a, um, a Android, which currently has a serious set of vulnerabilities and it connects to something else and, it, you know, and it propagates an infection, you know, it's sort of, we have to address that. So there are a number of different, the Europeans just put out IoT security guidance for the design of the, you know, the next generation architecture. California put a law in place last year that says you can't sell a device in, in California, but basically United States, if it's hard coded admin, admin, that you need to have a uh, be able to update the passwords, update the software um, with and bringing security in. The Japanese have, um, and mandatory, they have a law also and are doing red teaming against the products before they're allowed to be fielded. So we're just at the beginning. The problem is, is that we already have a, like a very um, deep or a great volume of insecure devices that have already been deployed. So, uh, you know, we have to still buy down the risk of yesterday's problem and, and really kind of correct tomorrow's problem or today's problem through consumer protection regulation. It's being addressed partially through some of the data privacy regulation, especially as, you know, as you all update PIPEDA and, Ca and California has just put pretty stringent laws in place about these things. Um, and we need to address it broadly as we're making these, as you make the $180 billion investment in updating your, your core infrastructures for moving and advancing to that accelerating to the digital economy, that that money has to be used not only to get the functionality for accelerating modernization, but 
resilience, safety, security, privacy, all have to be components of those decisions. And, th and that's where we have to bridge the gap of our decision makers. They are thinking first about the economic benefits and then we worry later about the security risks or the problems that those things bring to us. Yeah, so Scott, the, the kind of the good guy, so to speak, the good actor, it sounds like he or she has to be right all the time and, and a lot of the different areas that Melissa has has laid out. The bad guy only needs to be right once, uh, whether it's in hardware or in software or in physical compromising or in bribing a, a programmer, uh, bribing a security guard to let you take a picture of something. Is it, I guess, is, is this realistic to think that our world, as it, as it migrates online, that our world will be as secure as our world was kind of in, in the analog world? Well, so it, it very much is. It's, it's the, the, ho the analogy for Canada is hockey, and it's the being the goalie. If you're in defense, you're the goalie. You're the hero until the one puck gets in the net, and then, you, and then you're the most vilified person in the, in the city that you play for type of thing. Um, but you could have you could have stopped a million shots on goal until the one got in, and then you're, right. So so there's that. But but I think when you go back and you look at this, it's you asked a question: Is it reasonable for individuals to go through and do supply chain analysis? For maybe some of us, um, we might do it, but no, it's not. You can't because you won't get access to the data you need. Um, a lot of it is company proprietary; it's confidential. Um, but there is so. So how do we how do we start to deal with this? Um, part of it is a change in mentality where we look at individual devices needing to be secure, and we start to think about how do we secure the system. Assume that there will be data breaches, that there will be vulnerabilities, and we design it to be contained. And that's something that you know you hear things like zero trust, etc. That's where we're 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 heading that direction for the government of Canada's infrastructure, uh, because if not, it moves too slow. So how do we? build it so that we can contain very quickly. The other piece is how do we protect the data um, for either you're giving an authentic command. Um, so think of, think, of the, think of controlling the infrastructure in a city and you're controlling the lights. What do you care about? Do you care that somebody can read what the command is? No, you don't, you don't need confidentiality, but you wanna make sure that nobody put, turns both sets of lights green. Um, and then you have the, you know, the T-boning of the cars type of thing. Um, when you're doing a financial transaction, you know, who, everybody that's in the loop knows that you are at this store buying this thing, whether through contacts is delivery. What you want to make sure is that the that the vendor doesn't change your ten dollar purchase to a thousand dollar purchase. So you care about the integrity of the message. So going back to some of the basic principles here um, matters, but also as consumers, we need to start thinking about, you know, yeah, I get that this this light bulb is eight dollars on Amazon, um, and I can get it. Where is it manufactured? Um, why is it only eight dollars? But this one by Another company is 28 and they do the exact same thing. Guarantee you they've cut a lot of corners. Um, and if you're looking at a, if you're looking at say smart cities, they're going to be buying millions of sensors. A dollar per sensor starts to save some major money. And those are going to last for a decade. Yeah. That's how they're designed. They're designed to be low power, bulk, last for a long time, which means how do you update them? So you're entering, you're not entering just a you're not buying a you're not buying a thing. You're entering a relationship with the vendor of that product that you need to be thinking through. Is this going to be there in three or four years? If you've installed that smart doorbell, is it a company that exists? Are you paying for updates? Should you have to pay for updates? That's a great policy question. Um, and at the end of the day, I know there's some people that are listening to this in the government of Canada going, "Excellent! I love regulation. I, it's a great tool of the government. We are a market of 37 million people." Even with our American friends, we're a market of 400 million people. We, we're, we combine us with Europe, 800 million people. We still are outpaced by India, China, most of Asia, et cetera. And so how do we work together internationally to make some of these things standards? That's going to be the question. It has to be a standards. It can't be government by government regulation. Uh, that'll be the interim. But if we don't do it, we're not going to get the market we need. People, yeah. people, I can pick this up no matter where, and I can import it into Canada. So you're not going to stop me like you are with the lights, the, 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 the things that the Canadian Standards Association approves for like electrical gut gear. 
yeah. different approach. So so you've um, you've both been talking a, a kind of counter a little bit to what I've been saying, which is good. Uh, I've been playing kind of the the Cassandra, the world is falling. I think I'm hearing both of you say, if you take security seriously, if you focus on security, you can actually avoid a lot of these problems and. One of the industries that historically has taken security in this realm seriously has been the financial services uh, industry. They kind of got there before a lot of us, including before governments, because they, they I guess, kind of saw the future a little bit, that this was all coming online and that information protection was incredibly important to their brands and to consumer confidence. I wonder if I could hear from each of you a little bit what industries, not so much companies, obviously, but what industries Grosso Modo are kind of there, getting there and not there in Canada and the United States? Maybe, Melissa, is it like pipelines, financial services, sewers, cities? Who's kind of good and who's kind of not so good? Well, I, I Taki, I think you said it. I mean, the financial services is really the gold standard. And it, it dates back to 1994 when um, they started to move toward online transactions um, more broadly for, uh, and they, Citibank had the first real the grand theft of their institution, it was $10 million from Russian proxies or whatever. And that actually created the position of a chief information security officer and, and then the investment across that whole industry of ensuring that financial transactions could be secure across geographies, et cetera, and that they wouldn't lose money. Um, to be honest, the, the, there is really no other vertical sector that has embraced security along those lines because it's more of um, an operational risk of whatever they're uh, dealing with, not not as much as a, like real money, right? So the banks see it as uh, if I lose that, I, it's real money, it's my bottom line. Others see it as an operational risk, a legal risk um, that then leads to financial risk. And, and so uh, we have to still look to the financial services sector. But I would argue that um, we're, we're not, I don't think we should be necessarily designing that the function, the primary function is security. I really think that we have to be designing that the primary function is resilience. And that's different. That's a different engineering principles. And when you get to resilience, the best industry in my mind is really the is is electric power is is power you know electric hydro solar etc the power industry is is held to us an account of 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 resilience and 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 uptime and and so if we started thinking about that what's the mean time to restore mean time to recover and you know and, and you put it in those terms i think that that's really in, that's where we need to head because that'll change the investments and it'll also change the design of the of the base that's coming into these verticals yeah that's a tremendous point we teach that we hammer that home at the canada school a lot and a lot and a lot Stop thinking about risk. Think about resilience, which is to say, stop pretending that you know a global pandemic is coming. Instead, think about you know what would happen, how quickly could I get my employees back online or connected if, if there was no power, if you know, if our uh, IT center went out, if you know, if, 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 if. So don't think about the event that's coming. Think about how you respond to whatever event, whether it's weather or power lines going down or whatever the case. Scott, what, how would you answer the question, what industries are kind of better prepared than others, if that's the case at all? I think it's, um, I think maybe the, this is where the US and the Canadian context, just because of the, the number of players, it might be slightly different, but not substantially. That was a, I think on financial services, clearly the lead, there's no question. Um, but I think it's the maturity of their decision making. So if we go and we look at um, our ATM cards and you know magnetic swipe, we had swipe and pin technology, and then suddenly we all started getting chips, chip and pin technology. Why did why did that switch happen? Arguably, it's a much better technology. It's much more secure. But banks still held it back. That that's been available for a long time, because the because the cost to them wasn't enough to the, to, to to spend on the security upgrade. They could make the, their their customers whole. Um, the customers would be content, 
um, and it didn't cost them more than it would to implement. And then it cost across the threshold and they understood what that threshold was. So they had a very mature dis discussion. Um, I would say the contrary on the government side is that we accept zero. Like the answer for how much fraud is the government willing to accept, it's zero. So we will spend $150,000 to prevent a dollar of fraud. Banks won't do that. They will understand it. They will, they will contextualize it and they'll say, yeah, you know what? It was worth it. We've done that in, in the pandemic case, um, but we're not, we're not done yet. So we'll see what the Auditor General reports come out on some of the income support and things like that and how the media plays. Um, that was probably one of the most controversial things I'll say this entire time. Uh, it, but if you go and you look, I would say the electrical sector um, is taking this really seriously, the critical infrastructure sector, purely because they take a safety mindset. Um, re restoration, they've dealt with a number of, whether it be ice storms, hurricanes, um, sometimes terrorism, very rarely. Sometimes it's trees touching lines, um, power lines, but they understand resiliency and they understand how to restore. And so cyber to them is another means to, 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 to measure it. They have a measurement framework the same as the, the, the financial sector did. Telcos is the other one where you do see a substantial amount, but I actually think Melissa nailed it. And it really is, there's a lot of pressure because of the operations side. Um, and so their security tends to be about how do I protect my network so it can function? So I can, but I do, I do see a lot of changes there. They, they are, they do invest a lot in security that Canadians just don't see. They, they do spend money. Some of it is fraud prevention, but most of it is just fundamental security pieces. Um, and some of that is proactive. And so I don't want to discount them. They are spending money in Canada on this. We've been working with them for a number of years. Uh, but then the other sectors are, are behind municipalities. I just don't have the resources to tackle this problem. Uh, you mentioned water earlier. One of the things we actually went and had to go to a municipality and say, so we've got a report, your chlorination system's online. You could actually increase the chlorination in the water. Could you have killed anybody? No. Could you have made them sick? Yeah. And you certainly would have made the water stink and be undrinkable. Um, so like those are things that, but for them it was, hey, this just lets me manage this. It's a continuity of business was actually the reason they did it so that if they couldn't get to the plant, they could continue to increase um, and deal with these problems. So, you know, it, how do we start to tackle this as a systemic risk is the, is the real crux here. But I would say the sectors for me, those are the ones. Uh, finance, certainly way out there. I want to talk about one last issue before I, I close with asking each of you for kind of your advice for uh, Canadians and for public servants and for uh, our audience. So my last, uh, second last uh, area is ransomware. We're hearing a lot about ransomware. And I think we all kind of know what it is now. It's basically, uh, it's almost like a bank stick up in the old world. So, you know, in the old days, kind of bad guys would go to a bank and say, stick them up. Uh, and now uh, people aren't just kind of going into the banks as we've kind of heard banks are kind of protected against this or at least better protected. People are going into hospitals and saying, stick your hands up. People are going into school boards and saying, stick your hands up. People are going into municipal uh, land record registries. Well, they're not yet as far as we know, going into like pipelines and electricity grids and things like that, although you know, they, I'm sure they probably are. Uh, we don't know about it. What kind of give us your thoughts on ransomware, each of you, just as we close? Is it something we should kind of do? Is it something that's happening a lot more than we think? What should we know about ransomware, Melissa? So it is um, certainly was, I would argue that it was the other epidemic that was happening in 2020, 700% um, increase in ransomware attacks around the world. And um, so what is ransomware? Well, ransom gangs are basically um, breaking in or uh, exploiting a vulnerable patch, a patch that you haven't made or a vulnerable software and get into your enterprise, whether your enterprise is a hospital, a school system, as you said, um, accounting firm, insurance company, manufacturing, and, and the, the list goes on and on. The victims last year were, were, were remarkable and there was no sector untouched. And so they break in through a, basically a, vulnerable, a vulnerability that you haven't patched and, and that's hard to keep up with it when you have so many that you're dealing with. So whether it's Cisco, Citrix, Microsoft, you know, Oracle, pick your, pick your flavor. So they come in, 
and they are able to really map your network and uh, so that you they come in undetected and then and they basically map your network and they exfiltrate they steal your data they steal the intellectual property they steal the PII whatever it is that you make whatever your special sauce is and then um, about a week or two later they go and they encrypt all of the data and the systems and um, and so this makes it so you you know you get the black screen of death or the skull and crossbones on your computer and um, and so you can't use your anything and this has been really problematic at the hospitals because it's all patient records it's all the business systems it's it's many of those things um, and so this is a test of whether or not you're resilient. Does your company, can your company restore those business critical systems from backup data, backup data, backup systems? And the problem is, is that most companies cannot, and they certainly cannot do it from a mean time of 48 to 72 hours. So then they, they get um, issued a, a bill, a ransom. If you want your business critical system to be back up, you, you're going to pay us 10,000 Bitcoins, 500 Bitcoins, whatever it is, some kind of cryptocurrency. And, and this is where the dilemma becomes, right? Because you have to say, I can't restore those systems. And do I, how, how do I pay? Most organizations are not set up with a law firm or some, you know, a, a, some place that can get Bitcoin quickly. That becomes a problem. Then the next problem is, is am I actually funding a terrorist, which is what we have published in the United States. We've given um, guidance that you shouldn't be paying this because many of these are actually on our entity list of known to be affiliated with people um, um, that are supporting terrorism or things that we believe to be illegal. So it becomes a corporate dilemma then of, you know, do I pay the terrorists to restore my operations and the like? Um, and, uh, and I just see this going to increase because all of these corporate vulnerabilities are, again, at an exponential level. So it's easy picking. It's easy money. And so it's easy money for those countries that, and, um, and who could use proxies that are under major sanctions, Iran, North Korea, Russia. You know that are economically hurting. So, uh, and it said that last year alone, that the uh, North Koreans made over two billion U.S. dollars in um, the ransom attacks that they uh, conducted against the institutions around the world, because we're all paying. Scott, yeah, I'd just like to highlight a couple. Of, like that, that was the, a terrific description, and I think some of the big the big changes that we've seen is ransomware used to just be about they'd get in, they'd encrypt your hard drive you'd get a little message and then you'd pay. And it was more targeted to individual users and sometimes it would propagate in your network, but it's it's very much the more sophisticated state, state what we used to consider state level activities, reconnaissance, understanding what's critical to you, going in, corrupting your backups. So even if you have a good restore procedure, you can't use it, making sure that they go back in time. So you're, even your time backups are gone. Um, understanding who's the who are the administrators, who to go after, Etc. And finding and finding that thing, and then taking the information out. So if you choose not to pay, you're now su still suffering with this information out there that might be your customers, something that's your critical business process, your critical some piece of intellectual property, and and if you don't pay, you, they're going to let it go. So I would I would call it I wouldn't call it necessarily a bank robbery. I'd call it more like a kidnapping, something that you want desperately back, and you're willing to do anything you need as a business. These are business ending events. Um, and if you look at the critical infrastructure side, um, imagine if uh, if the ransomware locked out our ability for the for the for the hydro companies, uh, sorry, electrical companies. Um, we call them hydro up here, which is I know weird. Um, and it locked out the ability to switch on and off the transmission lines. It's going to be minus ten today, maybe minus twenty in Ottawa Ugh. Um, soon. Um, that's a major issue. You know, there, there's a huge incentive to pay here. Um, and then we've got to look, and when we looked at the National Cyber Threat Assessment, one of the things we pointed out, this only really works because of things like cryptocurrencies. There's a massive online market to buy these tools. You just have to have money to become a cyber criminal doing ransomware. Um, there are support organizations that any of us that have to call our IT support would kill to have the level of support that comes with um, cyber crime tools. And so the entire, we have to find ways to break this market down. Law enforcement is at the complete disadvantage. Cyber defenders are getting better at blocking, but this is a whack-a-mole game. Um, how do we deal with the policy implications of anonymous cryptocurrency that transfers this money? All the things about, are you funding terrorism? Are you funding criminals? 
well, you're, you're funding their next generation of cybercrime tools. You're essentially paying for them to come back and attack you when you pay that ransom. Um, and they know you're going to pay, by the way. What an some- hour. There are so many more things that, that we could discuss. Maybe if we're lucky, maybe we'll have you guys back uh, in a few months to talk about a few other things. I want to give each of you uh, a final word here. I want it to be a kind of a different final word from each of you. So Melissa, the final word we'd love from you is give governments some kind of free advice. And Scott, I'm going to give you a, a heads up. Uh, the free advice we want from you is give Canadians as individuals some free advice on what they can do in this area. Melissa. Uh, well, at a very tactical level, if I were advising President-elect Biden, I would say that the first thing that we really need to do, um, if I were to put solar winds aside, is that the ransomware problem is significant against our healthcare institutions. And we should pivot the operational capacity that we had for election security and work with our allies to really, really support the ability to deliver vaccines and and the storage facilities that are being ransomed, as well as the hospitals. We cannot afford to have a, a second pandemic along with what's happening. We have to be able to support safety in life. The second thing, oh, second so, no, thing sorry, say at, a, at a higher level, we really need to have um, available and affordable and reliable telecommunications infrastructure. And I think this applies to Canada as well. It's not affordable, it's not available, and it's not reliable right now. So, and I think that there's an opportunity beyond the 5G conversation is to be able to look at the delivery of uh, internet from space. Uh, It's real and it's actually disruptive to the telecommunications carriers. And I think it would actually uh, really get to our um, our outer territories for all of us. And, and, and since we're working from home and we're learning from home, this is essential for the continuity of our economy is that the telecommunications has to be affordable and reliable and available in, in that. And then the final thing I, I would say is that we really need to be thinking about um, the where the technology is headed and this and our dependence on the digital economy and demand for the functionality to be uh, driven by resilience and not low cost um, and field it fast, fixed it later. Scott, give us some free but profound advice for Canadians. Well, we have an entire site full of free advice for Canadians, but um, my thing would be, first of all, the basics of cybersecurity still matter. Um, we talked about some really big threats here. Um, and we've talked about big systemic things, but for a Canadian, patch, update, keep things up to date. And when you're looking at a product, don't just look at the bottom line cost. Look at for companies that actually care about privacy, and we'll talk about it. Not that superficially talk about it, but actually say, and here's your privacy settings, here's what you can look into. Um, I don't care what ecosystem you choose to be in, um, but think through privacy. And think, do I want this information available? Should I really be, and do I want it available in the place I'm putting it in my home? Do you want that smart speaker in your bedroom? Do you want a camera on your TV pointed at your bed, right? And I realize I picked a couple salacious kind of uh, examples, but think about it. Do do you want that there? Um, You know, there's a great cartoon where the 1950s person was like, okay, I don't want to talk about this on the phone. The government might be listening. And then the, the 2020 version of this is, hey, smart speaker, let me tell you about my life. Um, and I'm going to give it to a pri- couple private companies here. Um, and notice I didn't specifically mention a smart speaker vendor because um, they all they all do this, right? And so think about that. Just think about what you're what you're doing. I'm not saying don't do it. Um, there's a lot of great benefits that come with this technology. Just think of the the, the benefits from it. Um, but we need to not be naive. We need to think about this. Your your information is valuable. Do you need to do you need to put it there? The basics matter. Don't reuse passwords update your systems to Canadians, you do that, and you're already making yourself a bar above the victims of most of the things like cybercrime that you're most likely to be targeted. Wow, what an hour. Melissa, Scott, thank you for spending this hour with us. Thank you for educating us. And most of all, thank you for being friends of the Canadian Public Service. All our best, and we'll see you again soon. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.